And when I had my first job in my early 20s uh, at Columbia Records, um, as some of you know, there was a, this great um, uh, man named Goddard Lieberson who built Columbia, which was a kind of model to me growing up. And he, I remember him saying that it's much easier to teach a musician about business than teach a businessman about music. And um, what, what ended up happening, and you know, I knew nothing about the music business. I never took a, any kind of business class in college. Uh, I was utterly naive, but in fact, what Goddard said was true, is that the business part is the easy part. Um, and so, uh, through the years that I've you know, been in the business, you know, I was at ECM for about nine years, and I've been at Nonesuch for the last 32 years, that somehow, um, I've, I've always been keenly aware that um, one of my jobs, one of my responsibilities, was to make sure that every year that we took care of our own problems financially so that no one would ever have to come to me and say, you can't do this or you have to do that. Um, and I, um, you know, I will be glad to do an infomercial, I have to say, about Warner's having been there since 1978, first with ECM and since then with Nonesuch, that in the entire time I've been at Nonesuch, I have never been told that we had to sign an artist, we had to drop an artist, you couldn't make this record, the budget was too high. Um, and I think that the reason was, was that it was just the reality that it was our responsibility to make sure that the numbers took care of themselves and if, if that happened, no one was going to question any of our artistic decisions. So, yes, you have to understand um, and live with the reality of commerce as part of your world. Um, and then you hope to get lucky like we do and get struck by lightning every few years. When we uh, made our deal with World, with World Circuit, which included the Buena Vista Social Club, um, a record that when I heard the first time I thought, this is great, we might sell 25,000 copies. That record um, ended up, we, we had about half the world, um, including the US, and we sold um, over four million copies of that record. Um, and then in the other territories of the world, it sold another five million. So that record sold nine million copies around the world. But there's also satisfaction um, that we had with Goretzky Third Symphony, which was a record that hopefully all of you know that is based on these kinds of tragic um, stories of suffering um, in Poland during wars and even in World War II that sold over a million copies and went to number three on the British pop charts. And, but also great satisfaction about a Kronos record of George Crumb's Black Angels that could have sold 125,000 copies or um, uh, so many other albums that ended up the the, 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 the Mysterio de Vua Bulgare, um, an a cappella Bulgarian record that sold over 250,000 copies. That the determination of, of the success of a record is always a great thing to see, but I would say that we are complete amateurs in terms of understanding what the audience is actually going to do. Even when I was in my very first job um, at Columbia Records, you know, I was dealing with jazz artists, classical artists, um, and even Bruce Springsteen um, when 10 people showed up for his first gig at Max's Kansas City after John Hammond signed him. And so being around all this great music and understanding that not, not one form, what, what was really the most important thing was the uh, emotional power of that musician, the believability, and just the kind of joyous musical values that I cared about had a huge impact. Um, and when I got to Nunsuch, um, I was challenged. I was challenged because Nunsuch had a very good reputation for being a very good, uh, independent-minded classical record company, but it was a classical record company. Um, and they had never really even done things like the minimalist composers like Phil Glass and Steve Reich. Um, and so, I, as I started to step into waters that I had never been in, um, it was a little bit frightening. Um, but but I, you know, the, the moment where I think was a transforming moment was um, when we did the first record of the great Brazilian singer, who you may have seen at the Olympics, opening night, Caetano Veloso. Um, 
And, you know, what, what I realized was that, and this is why I say it was a liberating moment, was that here was none such that had dealt with, you know, many fine, great classical composers, but as an artist, it, it didn't make any of those people more significant than who Gaetano was as an artist. And so the decision was based on what that artist represented, what they did, how original they were. Um, and once that happened, things started cracking open, and it kind of liberated us to begin to look in different ways. Um, and again, it, 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 it was a continuation of that childhood experience of exposure, that college experience of being in that amazing moment in the Bay Area when you could go to Winterland, the Fillmore, to great jazz clubs, the San Francisco Symphony, and this idea that it's not about the genre, it's about the originality and the quality of music that touches you, that I think um, allowed us to actually create something um, that I think is kind of special and such.